five-man bench rules in favour of Prime Minister. Opposition MPs want hung parliament addressed. And ICCC to prosecute non-complying businesses. This is National MTV News with Denise Horere. Good evening and thanks for joining us for National MTV News. A five-man Supreme Court bench today dismissed opposition leader Belden Nama's application to have the election of Prime Minister James Marape on May 30th last year as null and void. Instead, it ruled in favour of Prime Minister James Marape, saying no constitutional laws were breached in this election and that Parliament can correct its own errors. Government lawyers welcomed this decision and praised the judiciary for its independence and for setting clear boundaries of the different arms of government. A court battle that lasted almost 18 months being filed straight after Marape was elected Prime Minister back in May 30, 2019, was concluded today in a decision in favour of James Marape by the five-man Supreme Court chaired by the Chief Justice Sergib Salika. While each judge had their own way of interpreting the laws in their own language, they all reached the same verdict, all for Prime Minister James Marape. All found there were no breaches of the Constitution when Peter O'Neill withdrew his nomination on May 30, 2019, and was accepted by the Speaker, arguing that Parliament's standing orders were not constitutional laws. They said the parliamentary conduct and procedures are non-justifiable, and Section 134 of the Constitution was upheld. This in simple terms means Parliament has the authority to correct its own errors, if any, and that nobody, even the courts, can interfere. And this message was well received by the government. There is a separation of powers between the legislative and the judiciary. And that's being re-emphasized again and echoed by the Supreme Court decision uh, this morning. There are certain things that we can never bring to court. Certain things belong to the respective uh, arms of the government, must belong there. And we should not always run to court to resolve matters. The five-man bench, after reading each of the judgments, all concluded that Nama's application be dismissed. The applicant, Belden Nama, has also been ordered to pay the cost of the first, second, third and fifth interveners on a party-to-party -party basis, if not agreed be taxed. Ruth Rungula, National MTV News. The Loloata faction of Parliament has welcomed the Supreme Court's decision to reject the application filed by opposition leader Belden Nama. Nama questioned the legality of the process in which James Marape became the Prime Minister in May last year. The government MPs held a news conference on the island resort soon after the court's decision. Shamein Poriambeb reports. It was all smiles at Lolowata today where the government has been meeting for the last few days. The Prime Minister, flanked by his ministers, have acknowledged the court's decision. In making an appeal to our citizens right across our country to remain uh, calm, peace, peaceful and remain uh, in a law-abiding manner right across our country, leave politics to politicians. The court distinguishes whether court goes and stop, where the judiciary, uh, where the legislature or parliament takes off, where the executive government, government takes off. Uh, you may must appreciate in this plan, I express him gratitude, you may equal or judiciary because I may demonstrate him also judiciary, I mean aware, Lord duties, not responsibilities, blah, now giving priority to cases where by law, you got potential of creating problems in our society. His ministers joined him in encouraging the opposition leader and members in the Vanimo camp to respect the court's decision and for all to work together for the interest of the country. So today, Supreme Court working this decision, me encouraging both sides, the opposition and government, to understand him, now accept him that James Marape was properly elected as Prime Minister in May 2019. Advice me with the sole legal, all get the line, other side, please. Let's be kind, let's be respectful, and give credit, uh, give credit where credit's due. Uh, the Prime Minister needs a bit, of pie, a bit more time, a bit more space, 
So you may try and support him. Election M22, it's 18 months from here. Still ain't no long way to mass. So right now it deserves everybody's support. Ministers also praise James Marape as the only PM by far that has equally distributed resources to all districts and provincial governments. Now let me make him triple walk about the Golo Bougainville. Let me put him big plan money in Golo Bougainville. Long this plan 80 million kina I'm now honorable Duma and Moglo Tok Tok Long and M by Lucas M 20 million by Kamlo Bougainville. Long Kamlo Bougainville. All people from Bougainville, from Kissim, this from money, and start him up life from me. Yeah. No government is working this place before. Um, the attention that the current Prime Minister now, the government given to all provincial governments, and completely different from uh, previous governments. Mm. So, me like acknowledge him, uh, Prime Minister Lord Isla. The Prime Minister said the camp here is more of a retreat where the government is discussing the plans and challenges of the year 2020 and plan for the year ahead 2021. To conclude 2020 financial year and work year and to prepare for 2021, which is very, very important. 2021 is the last year in preparation for 2022 national general elections and we want to get off 2021 in a better shape, better mode especially in respect to preparing census, common rule update, and uh, preparatory work for 2022 elections. We have continued working. Uh, from the moment these political issues came to the fore, our Prime Minister instructed us to get right back to work. Many of us have been visiting our districts, our provinces, continuing with work, and carrying out the very important review of the year gone by and what's to come ahead of us. With December 1st fast approaching, the Prime Minister calls on the opposition leader to accept the High Court's decision and not to try any bully tactics. Shamin Poriambe, National MTV News. The opposition camp has welcomed the Supreme Court decision in today's ruling of the election of the Prime Minister. And whilst awaiting the hearing and decision on the hung parliament, as alluded to by the opposition members, much of the Vanimo camp's concentration will now go into preparing to walk into parliament sitting on Tuesday, the 1st of December. Annette Cora reports from Vanimo. The Vanimo camp today welcomed the five bench Supreme Court ruling to uphold the election of Prime Minister James Marape. You know, it's uh, taken 18 months since we, since we instituted this uh, constitutional challenge. And uh, pursuing this case and coming to the finality of it is a, is a great relief. And I want to thank the judiciary for a very good decision that has come out, come out today. It's a precedent a decision, a unanimous decision by the court. This decision handed down by the Supreme Court ends the last 18 months of speculation on whether or not Marape was legitimately elected as Prime Minister because of the withdrawal of Yalebu Pangia MP Peter O'Neill as candidate prior to the vote for PM. According to opposition leader Belden Nama, this is not the reason for the current step to adjourn parliament by a majority of vote to the 1st of December 2020 on Friday 13th November 2020. Parliament adjourned, the majority who were sitting in Parliament and voting agreed to adjourn Parliament from the, from the 13th to the 1st of December. So it was 57 in the opposition, 39 in the, in the government who agreed. So a total of 96 to 0 agreed to adjourn Parliament to the 1st of December. So make no mistake that we in Camp Vanimo, we are prepared now, now that the Supreme Court has made a very clear ruling that the, in a democratically Westminster system of government, the majority rules. And we will do the right thing by our people and by the court decision that has just come out that Camp Vanimo will prepare to go into parliament on Tuesday, the 1st of December. Nama states that the 18 months grace period, which allows for that period, ends on the 30th of November 2020, which is why majority of the MPs resolved to adjourn Parliament to the 1st of December 2020 to allow for that. Fellow cohort leaders expressing satisfaction and appreciation by the Supreme Court ruling today. Challenge on the uh, Prime Minister's mandate 
must now be decided, decided by parliament. I am now calling on the uh, speaker and the clerk and the leaders on the other side to cooperate and, and to, to convene parliament on the 1st of December so that this issue can be decided uh, in, the, in, 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 in parliament, on the floor of parliament, as the Supreme Court is now saying. And um, I think that the way forward is, is clear. If uh, the Prime Minister says he has the numbers, the only way and the place to prove it is on the floor of parliament. We have said not only today, but in previous press conferences that we will always respect the uh, outcomes from the courts. We stand to take that direction. It is their role to interpret the Constitution and guide us. And importantly, today, the Supreme Court has upheld the doctrine of the separation of powers. Okay, and we anticipate that those same principles apply consistently across the board. We feel as members of parliament that today you have an executive that is enroaching onto the role of parliament that is deliberately using ways and means to avoid facing the will of the majority of the people of Papua New Guinea through their representatives on the floor of parliament. The current application before the Supreme Court by Yalibu Pangia MP Peter O'Neill is concerned with the legality of the Speaker's recall of parliament with minority members present on the 17th of November 2020, which includes the passing of the 2021 national budget and to adjourn parliament to the 20th of April 2021, when majority of the mandated leaders were not present as they had adjourned to the 1st of December. Whilst awaiting a decision to be made on the hung parliament as alluded to by the opposition, the Farimo camp will be preparing to walk into parliament on Tuesday, the 1st of December, 2020. And at Cora, National MTV News, Farimo. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. The Department of Personnel Management, in partnership with Number One Super, recently held an information session to provide helpful information to public service retirees. This comes after the release of 28.4 million kina by the Treasury Department to pay over 400 retirees last month. The information and awareness session aims to educate retirees on better retirement choices. The information and awareness session saw retirees from various government agencies in attendance. The 481 retirees were from the Police Department, Transport, Works and Implementation, National Museum and Art Gallery, National Cultural Commission, Morobe Provincial Administration and various provincial health authorities. The information session with Number One Super Limited is to educate them on better life choices after retirement. This comes after dialogues with Number One Super on how they can assist public servants spend and their retirement savings wisely. This is part of the government's five-year retirement strategy commencing this year, especially for those in the compulsory retirement age of 65. In this year's budget, 430 million kina was approved to retire over 2,000 compulsory workers. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic and other factors, the payment was delayed. Last month, over 28 million kina was released by the Treasury Department to pay the retirees. A further request has been made to the Treasury Department to pay the second batch of retirees. With the government's commitment to continue this retirement exercise, over 400 million kina has been allocated in the 2021 budget and it is anticipated that the government will save over 14 million kina once the retirees are taken off the payroll. With the implementation of the retirement strategy, the public service is also cleansing the payroll system. This will see the implementation of the one person, one position, one payroll policy. The secretary further thanked the retirees for their service and encouraged them to get into savings mode and plan their retirement well. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. The lay Metropolitan Superintendent Chris Kunyanban says the Bumayong police station is completed but needs to be officially opened before police can move in. It was completed earlier this year with funding from the Nawab District Development Authority. Mr. Kunyanban said the new police station is long time coming for the Bumayong community where law and order issues are ongoing. 
The Lei Metropolitan Superintendent said police are waiting for the contractors to officiate at the opening before police operations can begin. As soon as the police station is completed, uh, then it will be given over to the police to be used. And uh, I also, I went there when I first took the office, I went there basically to look at the station. And um, seriously, uh, Bumayam needs a very good police station. And uh, I think what they, what they have done, uh, the private sector, I'll be in particular, um, company that then building for the police station done a wonderful job. It's just the completion part of it, the students and competitive, and then we can commission it to be used for policy purposes. Lay Secondary's principal thanked parents for paying fees despite late payments of subsidies by the government. COVID-19 was the reason why fees were delayed. The subsidies were through the government tuition fee subsidies. Like all other schools, Lay Secondary School Fee subsidies for this year were delayed due to COVID-19. The fees arrived very late. Lay Secondary's principal Christopher Raymond said parents were asked to pay fees to help the school run during lockdown. Why I really have to acknowledge our parents is because it was through their payment of fees that actually saw us getting things off the ground. Parents have been very supportive over the last 10 years. Their contributions have ensured that the school's plans have gone unhindered. Old classrooms have been broken down and rebuilt. A new library was built a few years ago and a new school logo was unveiled yesterday. About 200 students graduated yesterday, making them the second lot to use the multi-purpose school hall funded partly by their parents' contributions. Especially for our adjunctable classes like grade 10 and the grade 12, we have completed all of what is required. Throughout Papua New Guinea, up to 30,000 grade 12 students will be graduating this month and the next. They'll be confronted by the bottleneck in tertiary institutions with many mission out on office to universities and colleges. This is something that has not yet been resolved by the education system. Philia Pisab, National MTV News, Lay. And now looking at the Nest Fund market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0.2775 US dollars, 0.3729 Australian dollars, 0.2248 Euro, and 28.26 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher, coffee closed higher, cocoa and copra closed lower, crude oil is trading lower, palm oil closed lower, and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 173.77 points lower, the ASX 200 is trading at 14.37 points lower, and the All Ordinaries is trading at 32.75 points lower. Among stories after the break, ICCC says it will prosecute companies that increased food prices during the COVID-19 emergency period. Welcome back. Consumer Watchdog, the Independent Consumer and Competition Commission, is now taking steps to prosecute businesses that have failed to pay their fines after being penalized for not obtaining approval prior to increasing food prices. The businesses were identified and imposed with fines as part of the State of Emergency Price Surveillance Exercise, which the ICCC carried out earlier this year in the major centers of the country. ICCC Commissioner and CEO Paulus Ein made this known in a media conference this morning. 
The main purpose behind the national government's declaration of a state of emergency at the beginning of this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic was to prevent, detect, contain and mitigate the effects of the global pandemic in Papua New Guinea. And the ICCC's involvement during the SOE was related to its mandate to conduct price surveillance exercises to protect consumers of certain goods and services and to ensure these were offered to consumers within allowable parameters. From those visitations, we have issued uh, infringement notice to 400, 246 uh, business houses who have uh, failed to comply. And uh, so far, half of them have paid up uh, the fines and uh, the balance remained. We followed up and the others are still uh, paying up but there are others who are unwilling and reluctant. So those business houses, we have taken steps to take them to court. The ICCC was responsible for implementing certain SOE orders. Among other reasons, the gist of these orders were to ensure that businesses could increase prices for declared items, but could not increase by more than 5% from their original prices. The consumer watchdog was also to make sure that where a business had no choice but to increase the price due to wholesale increases or drastic changes in the supply chain, it would have to seek the approval of the commission to increase beyond 5%. Also, where the business increased their price without first obtaining approval from the ICCC, it could impose a spot fine of 5,000 kina for a first-time offender and 10,000 kina for a repeat offender. What's there for the ICCC? Uh, we are now taking steps to amend our legislation, the Prices and Regulations Act, uh, to help us to continue some of this exercise uh, in a different way. Uh, we've started this process uh, early last year, and uh, the process to amend legislation is, is a very tedious process. So we are going to, to the normal uh, government process to amend uh, the prices regulation set so that it gives us uh, more power, more tool, more teeth uh, to do some of our work. Here. In implementing the prices regulation, the ICCC issued over 200 infringement notices to more than 100 businesses around the country who were found to be non-compliant. The ICCC will prosecute the businesses that fail to pay their fines. Commissioner Ayn said the ICCC has filed proceedings in the Waigani District Court against Papindo Trading Company for failing to pay its fine to the ICCC pursuant to Order No. 8 of the Price Regulation Act. Papindo was found by the ICCC to have increased its prices for rice and sugar in the Goroka retail outlets without first seeking approval from the ICCC to increase. The commissioner said Papindo is the first of many other prosecutions that the ICCC will be taking up in the next two months. Turning overseas, riot police and water cannons have been unleashed on heartbroken fans mourning the loss of Argentinian football legend Diego Maradona. The 60-year-old suffered a fatal heart attack and was laid to rest this afternoon. There was a desperate scramble to see his casket before he was buried. This is what happens when grief turns to desperation. Thousands had descended on the presidential palace, hoping to be part of Diego Maradona's send-off. But as temperatures rose, so did emotions. Strict rules ignored in a country hard hit by COVID-19. Police couldn't contain the crowds. The videos that I've been seeing from friends of mine who have personally went down and visited, uh, it seemed that numbers were getting too great. There are injuries and arrests, and public viewing came to an early end after fans broke down the barriers. The casket of the football legend had been laying in the main lobby, covered with the nation's flag and the national hero's number 10 shirt. Mourners threw on dozens of others. A ceremony mixing head of state honours with the chaos of a rowdy stadium. 
the president and vice president among those paying respects. But countless others wanted to do the same, and not all of them could. A line of people snaked along more than 20 blocks. Football has died, so we have to remember him in the best way. He was one of the best. It's, it's like a royal has died. For many, this was their last chance to pay homage before the hearse and its motorcade took him to be buried next to his parents. The most public of send-offs ending with a private final farewell in a country that's not ready to say goodbye. And Trukai Sports is next. Kilawani is at the sports desk. Yes, Dennis, the Women's National Soccer League was officially launched last night and looking ahead to the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup. Join me for the details after the break. Tukai Sports. Good evening and welcome to Tukai Sports. 14 teams will battle for the top prize in the revamped Women's National Soccer League 2020-2021 season. The season was launched last night in Port Moresby. The women's edition of the National Soccer League set to kick off next week for the Northern and Southern Conferences. A total of 14 clubs from as far as East Sipik, the Highlands, Morobe, NCD and Central all ready to try their talents against each other. The competition is expected to be bigger and better in the 2020-2021 season as the competition should see more than 350 players take the field. The competition draws will be out soon. Bradley Valenaki, Trukai Sports. And still on the launch, a senior government official has praised women's football in the country. Community Development Secretary Anna Bai says without proper competition, PNG women's football has dominated the Pacific Islands for over 20 years. Now the focus for the footballers is to make the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup. From no proper structured competitions, PNG has been the team to beat in the Pacific region. They've shown they are the undisputed queens after the last Pacific Games gold medal performances. If there's anything we need to invest in, especially for sports, it's women's soccer. Sorry, May, I'm not pushing you out, but I think the women have shown this nation. They have shown us. We have an issue with consistency, but if they can do consecutive five, six gold, can you imagine? Just imagine that. And why not? With the raw talent, with little exposure to the more structured football nations, PNG took on the world in the FIFA Under-20 World Cup, scoring a memorable goal in one of its matches, the first in a FIFA-sanctioned final. And we watch these young girls, these women, and you could tell that, you know, they were wrong and they came to winning gold. And, and for me, that's gold. That is talent. With that fresh in memory and the WNSL online once more, it should be a proper pathway to the next step, which is the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup down south. If we want to get there, we've got to believe in ourselves. We've got to have the passion. Then we will get there. 2023 is not just far away, it's just very, very close. You ladies will create that history. In two years' time, probably much better than the men. 
the president confirming funding has been given from FIFA to drive the women's agenda in football to new heights. A World Cup appearance is likely if the preparations are consistent and of high quality. Bradley Valenaki, Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports continues with cricket at home and abroad. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. The 40-over Women's Isuzu National Cup got off with a high-scoring match between Isuzu Teal and Isuzu Pink at Amini Park in Port Mosby. With Isuzu Teal winning on day one of the tournament, Isuzu Pink returned the challenge in day two, winning by four wickets with two balls to spare. Day one was a day for the batters, with 400 runs scored and only the wickets lost between the two teams. Tim Teal, led by an unbeaten 91 runs of 104 balls from Tanya Ruma, scored a comfortable six wickets victory after being set 201 to win of 40 overs. Vicky Ara was the best of the Teal bowlers, taking three wickets. Isuzu Pink batted first, setting Teal an impressive 6 for 200 off their 40 overs, thanks to an outstanding partnership between Pauke Siaka and Sibona Jimmy. In reply, Teal were a little shaky, losing two wickets with only a handful of runs on the board. Tanya Ruma and Killer Frank dominating the middle overs to have Teal cruising to their 201 run target. Frank fell for 55 runs, but Ruma and Ara chased down the remaining runs within 37.4 overs. In day two of the tournament, Team Pink squaring the ledger, scoring a four-wicket win over Isuzu Teal in a tightly contested match. Team Pink 6 for 175 of 36.4 overs, defeating Isuzu Teal 4 for 174 of 40 overs. National head coach Joseph Dawes has expressed content to see that the batters have adapted well to the longer format in day one, while in day two showcased more of the bowler's skills, making scoring difficult on the second day of tournament. Dawes adding the aim is to challenge the lowers to keep improving. Head coach has noted Tanya Ruma in outstanding form, who made a century in day two, scoring 196 runs in the two matches. Daw stated that this tournament and scheduling is great for the development of the current and future Lewis, adding a great platform for preparations towards the 50 over Women's Cricket World Cup qualifier in 2021. To cricket abroad, it's been 20 long years since international cricket has been broadcasted in New Zealand. The last match was in the summer of 1999. Television in the early 1970s helped launch the sport to new generations, introducing, introducing one man in particular. 1974, Christchurch, the Richard Hadley stutter step is seen on live TV for the first time. The new age of Kiwi sport in colour and a first ever test win over Australia. There it is. Things were a little different back then. If this was you at Lancaster Park, we'll be knocking on the door of your rest home very soon. Four years later, 1978, Wellington, a first ever win over England. Cameras back then were only at one end of the ground. Enough, though, for the TV birth of our greatest, Sir Richard Hadley. Hadley became a national chart. Shirtless, drinking tinned beer, sunscreen hadn't been invented. Also an era when the Windies were king and king villains. Well, he hit umpire Fred Goodall. If we thought that was bad, February 1st, 1981, live on TV One, late on a Sunday afternoon, beamed him from Australia, the world almost ended. And that's a disappointing finish. And that was an understatement. We needed a knight in shining willow. Lance Cairns and his Excalibur bat answered the call in 83. He's got hold of it. It's a big one. From the smasher to the dasher, the late great Martin Crowe, who grew up on our TV screens just out of his teens. November 8th, 1985, Brisbane. On a Friday before the six o'clock news, Richard Hadley had already ripped apart Australia. Oh, and he's gone 
through Phillips as well. When we were at primary school, we were able to go to, to, to the library and watch, uh, watch Channel 1 and, um, and watch the cricket, and I don't think we did a lot of work. By the time the last TV1 games were aired, crimes against cricket fashion became regular. Our last match in 1999 featured Stephen Fleming and Craig McMillan, commentators tonight. Two kids who grew up in cricket's last free-to-air era. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports. Dennis will be back with the weather report. Bye for now. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. Weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow to re regional forecast and in the southern region Port Moresby partly cloudy with chances of rain showers and drizzles, Daru partly cloudy with a few showers, Kerama a shower or two, Alotau mostly fine and partly cloudy, Popondetta partly cloudy with a shower or two. To the Momase region Lay partly cloudy with few evening showers, Medang rain showers and thunderstorms easing, Wewek a few showers then partly cloudy, Vanimo partly cloudy with a few evening showers. To the New Guinea Islands region, Lorengau a few thundery showers, Kavieng thundery rain showers, Kokopo, Rabao, Kimbe and Buka cloudy with evening showers. And to the highlands region, Mount Hagen occasional rain showers and thunderstorms, Goroka and Kundiawa a few evening thundery showers and drizzles, Mendi and Wabeg partly cloudy with evening rain drizzles. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. The way it is this Friday, the 27th of November 2020, from the news team. Enjoy your weekend. Good night.